Welcome to Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Ray Paprocki, a member of the Board of Trustees. I'm also publisher and general manager of Dispatch Magazines, which includes Columbus Monthly, Columbus CEO, and nine other titles. So today's forum is the African American Leadership Academy, rich in talent and strong in community. This is sponsored by the law firm of Crabb, Brown and James, as well as Deloitte. Each are represented by many friends and associates here today. Won't you please help me thank them for their support. Now uh, let's welcome John McEwen, managing partner at Deloitte, to introduce our forum and speakers. John. Okay, thank you, Ray, and thank you, friends. Uh, Deloitte is proud to support CMC and convene these weekly public forums to discuss the important issues of the day. And today is no different. The great democracy of the United States has endured many growing pains, including the times in which we find ourselves today. The differences of the haves and the have-nots are stark and racial differences, biases known or not, and systemic policy problems have made hazy the hope that hard work will pay off with a reward. While we all may be created equal, the playing field and the rules by which we play are not always so. There is a future when strong leaders point the way, guiding others to overcome adversity and achieve their potential. So let us welcome our speakers today. Partner at Jones Day and former Ohio Supreme Court Justice Yvette McGee Brown. The best, the best smile. <laughs> uh, President and CEO of the Columbus Urban League, Stephanie Hightower. Uh, Managing Director of Perscolis Columbus, Tony Cunningham. And our host, President and CEO of Rama, Inc., Mo Wright. Mo? Thank you, Mo. It's all yours. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me. I get to have two of my families together. Uh, many of you know I know from the Metropolitan Club, having served as the longest serving board member. I don't set it out of pride. I think, I don't know, Jane wouldn't let me leave, so uh, I stayed around for a while. Uh, and then certainly I had the pleasure, uh, in addition to Rayma serving as co-executive director of the African American Leadership Academy along with Ms. Donna James, who's away on, on business. So I'm I, uh, happy to see everybody, and, and uh, it's good to have all of our family together to have this uh, important community conversation about the academy, our work, and our impact in this community. Uh, as I open today, because I see so many of you in the audience today, I'm just going to ask all of the members, the fellows of African American Leadership Academy to stand so you can see who they are and how, how well they are represented today. Very good, very good. And we also have members of our advisory board here, if they would stand uh, just to make sure they are also recognized. Thank you for your leadership. I get a chance to work alongside these dynamic leaders each and every day. As we start the conversation today, I want you just to imagine with me for a second. Let me uh, pique your imaginations. Imagine you're working at a major law firm or a major corporation downtown. After years of staying late, working hard, leading well, and uh, developing the confidence of your colleagues, you get the promotion. You're now on the senior leadership team. Or perhaps you've uh, been tapped to lead a major nonprofit in our community or to set up a new initiative in our community from the ground up, or ask to run for elective office, or to take the entrepreneurial leap. It all seems exciting, right? Now imagine if you're black or African American in this community. What sets into your mind? Do you ask yourself, are you ready? If what got you here will keep you there? How do you deal with the pressure? Are the expectations different for you? How do you not get in your own way? Using our strengths-based, efficacy-based curriculum at the Academy, we take 20 individuals annually and go deep on exploring the answers to these and many other questions in line with our guiding principles. 
Our graduates, who are 205 in number, represent some of the best and brightest, most influential, not just African-American leaders in this community, but leaders in this community. President and CEO, Deputy Chief of Staff, Judge, School Board Member, Executive Director, Managing Partner are just a few of the titles represented by our graduates. We are guided by two guiding principles of the Academy. The first, in order to become a leader, you must first become who you are by the Leadership Authority, Mr. Warren Bennis. And then we like to talk about this idea of how do we do good while also doing well. In 2019, the African American Leadership Academy celebrates 15 years of developing leaders and inspiring change and thought leadership in this community. Our panel today will give you a snapshot about our impact, why we believe this organization is so vital to Central Ohio, and what we believe is a part of our secret sauce in developing African American leaders to serve this entire community. You've already heard them uh, introduce, and there is information about their backgrounds in the forum flyer, but I'm gonna open uh, up to the panel, and I'm gonna ask each of you to respond to this first question. We have your bios, uh, and they all are impressive, and I know this group, so this is gonna be a hard group to, to maintain. Uh, but I'm gonna try my best, I'm not sure how I got this job, but, uh, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna tell you which one is gonna be the problem child. She's, she, actually, I don't know, today, depending on, yeah, who had coffee this morning, it's gonna be one or two, but we'll, we'll make it work. I'm a good child. We've got your bios, but I want, to, I want to ask you this. If I asked your grandmother, your grandfather to describe you, Ooh. how are they gonna describe Yvette <laughs> Stephanie and Tony. What does grandma, what does granddad say? Ooh, mm, mm. Mm. Um, mine would say stubborn. Um, sometimes, she used to say to me, you got two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think she would say hardworking and um, yeah, I think that's what she'd say. Okay. Seven. So there is the um, African American version of this, ah. <laughs> and there's the majority community version of this. So I would say she would say hard-headed, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, definitely loud, uh, and um, um, energetic. And which version was that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to it. <laughs> Tony? So I am my mama's only child, as you know. And uh, so I think that they would say loving, uh, caring, and also just really, really um, hardworking and wanting to, do, wanting to do good for everyone putting myself last. Very good, very good. Yeah. So let's jump into the conversation. Yvette, I'm gonna start with you because you serve as chair um, for this entire time of the African American Leadership Academy Thanks, Advisory Larry. Board. <laughs> 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 well, we're gonna get a chance to talk about him too, right? Uh, but you also have been at the table from the very beginning, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Talk about who was at that table and talk about what the conversation was when this idea about AALA came up. So it's really interesting to see where we are today. It was 15, 16 years ago actually, when Larry and Larry James and Donna asked me, Janet Jackson, and Don Vickers, who was then at the uh, Jefferson Center, um, asked us to dinner. And as we were having dinner, he said, we need to come up with a way to replicate ourselves. He said, every time the phone rings for a black leader, they call one of us, and we're tired. And so there ha we have to have a way to create more black leaders in the community and to get the majority community to see that there are other people who can lead. It's not just the four people of color sitting around this table. And so it developed from that initial conversation really with Larry just driving it relentlessly. He went around to companies. I think our first sponsors were L Brands and Nationwide, um, and there may be one or two others, but he went around to them, asked them for a small investment, and with Donna, really, she was the, the gem, Donna and Bo Chilton initially started designing what the curriculum would look like, and we were off and running, and really, the goal is to pick people who are in that mid-career, that 30 to 40 range, who are looking for their next up, but we take them through a very rigorous application process, because we 
want you to define what you see as your own leadership potential. Because a lot of people see leadership as just getting their name in the paper or having their picture taken. And it's so much more than that. And it's been really a pleasure to watch this academy go from its first class to now its 15th class and watching the young people who have just really moved forward in their careers. You'd be amazed at just the leadership positions our fellows have moved into after really doing that deep dive and understanding what may have been getting in their way. Yeah, yeah. Tony, I'm going to come to you next because you were a part of the, the best class of the academy. Absolutely. Uh, class two, that was my class. Class two. <laughs> <laughs> we made all the mistakes with class one is what you're saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. And then, it, you know, there's a famous song that says it takes two. <laughs> I don't know if you know, yeah. Anyway, uh, Tony, so talk to this audience who are, are not familiar with the Academy. Who are the Academy? Who are the members? What's the profile? What, what, the, what does it mean to be an AALA fellow? So um, it was pretty amazing to be selected for the opportunity. Um, and when I looked around me, I found individuals, some, some that I knew and some that I didn't, who were doing some amazing things already. Um, they were already blooming where they were planted. You know, they were already making moves and getting some things done. And um, we sometimes would talk about, man, we would love to get to know the Stephanie Hightowers and the, the, the Yvette McGee Browns of the world um, and engage with them and find out how they did it and what were they doing. And so I think there were a lot of curious folks, a lot of highly motivated people, people who were very driven. And also the common theme was they all wanted to give back. Many of us were already involved in some sort of service capacity, whether we were volunteering or running programs and different things in the community, helping out nonprofits. So we already had that lens. And um, so it was just amazing to, to link up with folks who were like-minded and then go through this journey of self-discovery with them and then to make these lifelong friends and now to see where even my class is now. You know, Mo and I were part of class two. I couldn't believe that, like 2006. And so to see where uh, many of us are now is just amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stephanie, I'm gonna come to you as, as certainly as president and CEO of the Urban League and also a member of our advisory board. You're really at the forefront of issues of disparity and access and, and diversity and inclusion in our community. Why is an AALA important in Columbus? Why, is, why do we have this need? Sure, and um, thank you all. Let me just say thank you all for being here today. Just looking out, seeing the sea of people of color um, engaged in this conversation, um, I think is really important. Um, so just thank you for being here. It, here's why I think it's important, and I want to go back to a little bit to that um, initial question that you talked to or you asked Yvette about and how this whole thing came about. So, you know, you're, you'll probably continually hear Larry James's name, um, as many of us call him, the godfather um, in our community. Not that godfather that's on TV right now, right? But, <laughs> well, he can uh, be. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Um, But uh, there was a time when I, I had a different journey moving through this community because I came from Ohio State, being um, an Olympic athlete, um, having those connections from The Ohio State University, it put me in positions probably a lot faster than normally I would have been put in. <clears throat> However, I didn't have the benefit of an AALA, and so when I started approaching and looking for mentors, um, basically Donna said, I can't deal with her, Larry. I need you to take her. Um, <laughs> Larry said, because you're a little rough around the edges. <laughs> and so Larry volunteered um, to take me on as um, from a mentoring capacity to help to guide me and help me to begin to navigate. Um, so I share that with you to say there was a time when there wasn't a program like this, and so for those of us who had the benefit from our relationships of being engaged in different um, uh, uh, um, aspects of the community, we were there, we were fine, but what you didn't have was those people helping you, talking about disparities, talking about equity. How do you bring up that next generation of African Americans? Um, as the Larrys and the, you know, at the time when I can go back, the Jerry Hammonds and those people, Warren Tylers, were getting ready to pass the baton, it was one of those things where, who are we passing the baton to? And then I felt like there was nobody passing the baton. And so when you look at what's happening in our society right now as, as it relates to economic mobility, when you look at the disparities around how 
housing, when you even look in the boardrooms today and you look in the C-suites in this community and you do not see people of color, or when you look at the boards, especially with nonprofits like mine and with Tony's, and you do not see African Americans of senior status that are sitting on these boards to help us, to help navigate um, in the corporate community, you see more and more why there is a need and why I am not only committed to, but a strong proponent of making sure that we have programs such as AALA that can help empower that next generation of African American leaders in our community. But it's not just about the self-discovery and it's not just about the doing good um, um, and doing well, but it's how do we begin to really look at our next generation of folks to help them understand the importance of being your authentic self, that it's okay to be black that it's okay to be understand what your heritage is and where you come from, that you don't have to go into these rooms and you have to code switch, that our children can actually be themselves and be able to contribute in a way that is beneficial not only to themselves but to this community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I want to stay on that theme just for a second because one of the things we talk about in the academy is, so we ask the fellows at the end of their journey to, to give us some reflections. And so recently we were having a conversation um, with the last class and they were talking about kind of what these seeds of growth they had experienced over the last nine months. And one of the fellows um, asked a question. She said, we're talking about our growth, but she said, we're not having the conversation about what's wrong with the soil that these seeds are planted in. In other words, what needs to happen in this Columbus Central Ohio environment so that really African American Leadership Academy doesn't need to exist or, or, or the things we're talking about. What needs to happen? Because the folks that are here are representing organizations who may be looking for, wanting to do, how do they cultivate uh, black talent? How do they keep and retain black talent within their organizations? What do organizations need to start thinking about in order to make sure the soil, that environment is right for our community to really thrive within their organizations? Any thoughts on that? Well, one, I think they've got to look at their own organization. So if you're looking in your boardroom, if you're looking in your senior management team, if you're looking in, at your staff meetings and there are no people of color sitting around the table, that's something that needs to be cured. Because the reality is your customer base is becoming increasingly people of color. And even from a business standpoint, you need to have viewpoints of people that don't look like you. So I would say everybody has to do an audit, not just looking at the diversity numbers on you know, your macro monthly personnel spreadsheet, but look at the rooms that you're in. When you're making critical decisions, are there people in there who reflect the rich diversity of this community? And then all of you have training programs where you can start to give people opportunity. I often say to our young lawyers, who's talking about you when you're not in the room? Mm -hmm. Right? You need to make sure that you are sponsoring people of color. The woman who became the CEO of um, Xerox, I love how she tells the story. She was an engineer, a black woman, and she just happened, she, they were having a staff meeting, asked the president of the company a question and kind of debated with him on the question and then he later pulled her aside and he said I want to meet with you and he is responsible for giving her tough love sometimes and that's the other thing we all got to listen to sometimes people are going to tell you things you don't want to hear yeah. oh. and if that person sitting in the C-suite pay attention because they're telling you that for your own good but she talks about how he gave her lessons on professionalizing her wardrobe how she was showing up in meetings how she asked questions so so that people could hear her and not immediately turn her off. And she went from being an engineer to being the CEO of Xerox. And so each of us within our spheres of influence have the ability to do that so that the soil in our organizations is fertile for African American and Hispanic leadership to grow up, and then that will change the community. So think, um, Mo, I think about, too, retention, yeah. right? And so the organization I'm in, we train a lot of people of color and offer them the opportunity to get their first tech position. And we've had some of our graduates go into these organizations and not stay, mm -hmm. not because they couldn't manage the work, but because the equity and inclusion piece was not um, cultivated or taken care of in the organization. And so it's one thing for the CEO and others in the top to say, we want this and we believe this and we want diversity. It's another thing to make sure that that message trickles down to the leaders in every level of the organization and what will and will not be tolerated and what are some of the inclusive things that we've created so that people feel they can show up and be their authentic selves, they can contribute, and then they want to stay. It creates 
creates loyalty. It creates this ability for me to grow someplace. But right now, I think we have some serious challenges around equity and inclusion that need to be discussed just as much as diversity is discussed. Because it's great to bring them on. It's great to say, I'm not going to look at the slate if there's not a diverse slate. But what happens to that person after new hire orientation? Mm -hmm. So that's my question, because that's where I've seen it fall off. Very good. Of, yeah, if, if I could build on that, you know, and I want to, I want to speak to the folks that are in this room. I think that all of you and many of you are in um, positions um, within the corporate or nonprofit uh, community or in higher education, and you have a responsibility. Um, it should not just be us expecting folks from the majority community to be responsible for talking about equity um, and inclusion or talking about diversity. Um, you sit in your seats now because there was somebody else that helped you to get there, and I think sometimes we forget about that. Um, we think around, I can think around and look around this room from, you know, the vets or from the Larrys or from um, the Janet Jacksons, who those of we went and talked to who helped us get in those rooms. And so you have a responsibility to not only help the next, but please don't rip, don't forget how you got to the room. Because I think sometimes as a community, we forget how we got there, and then we get there and we think we done done something. That's right. You know That's what? Right. And you ain't done nothing. Okay. <laughs> All right. You got a long way to go. You know, unless you sitting up in one of these rooms up here with CEO, um, sitting behind your name and you're commanding 500 million, so many billion, then you ain't doing nothing. Okay. And so I think sometimes we forget. They told me not to cut up today. Yeah. <laughs> I told you you would be a problem, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's my good friend. We need her. I want to stay there for a second, actually, though, because um, one of the things we deal with in the Academy is this idea of getting out of your own way. There's a lot of self-talk that happens um, in all of our heads, regardless of your background, that sometimes can get in your way. Uh, if you guys could be transparent, think about that journey before you were partner and, and present CEO. What was some of that advice? What were some of those things you had to get clear about that was getting in your way that you'd be willing to, to share with this audience about you having to make some changes and do things a bit differently? So I, I really, I think the, the mentorship thing is really important, and I, they've heard this story before, but I, when I was a young lawyer at the Attorney General's office, you know, I grew up in the Brittany Hills area, and I didn't grow up in a family where you sat at the table and negotiated. My mother needed immediate compliance, or there was a physical punishment. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> there was no, like, let's negotiate, you're getting a week of no allowance, whatever that was. Is that, so, is that yeah. a majority community say it? <laughs> So, so when I went to work, again, first gen, right? I, I'm in the attorney general's office, and this is where the value of having senior people, and this was a person from the majority community, because I took every criticism or every all feedback as criticism, as negative, because in my own head, I was thinking they were saying I didn't belong here, that I wasn't good enough to be here, because I had my own insecurity issues where the reality is I was 25 years years old. I just graduated law school. I didn't know how to be a lawyer. Nobody does. And so you're going to get feedback. And so what happened with me is when I had had a very loud um, disagreement with my section chief, um, so loud that my secretary came and closed the door, um, <laughs> and I was not very nice because, you know, in Brittany Hills, you post up, you know, and I, I, I thought that went back. I, I went back to my roots, you know, I thought he was, you know. <laughs> So I really got a little beside myself. And a senior white male lawyer came into my office. I'm all of 26 years old, and he walks in, he shuts the door, and he says, so how do you think that went? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I'm still mad. I'm still all emotion. And he said to me, let's talk about what you want your future to be. He said, because if this is your response, anytime you get upset, this is where it ends for you. He said, but I'm not saying you didn't have some valid points, but that is not the way that you raise them. And so he started taking responsibility for smoothing off those rough edges, teaching me how I needed to deal with things that I saw as negative, because they were right, his comments, if I'd taken any time to process them and not just responded viscerally. And so having those people 
It's two things, having those people that are willing to say that to you, which in our litigious age becomes less and less, mm -hmm. and you having the willingness to listen to them. Because people are going to help you, but you have to be willing to listen and be introspective. One of the things that Warren Bennis always says about becoming a leader is that you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be willing to look in the mirror and see those things that you do well and those things that you don't do well. So it really is being open to that two-way feedback. So I still post up from time to time. You know? <laughs> See, I wouldn't go. In say my it. work that I do, you have to post up a little bit. No, I shouldn't. <laughs> okay, Larry, I'm not gonna cut up no more. Um, anyway, so you know, I will say this. But she What's... does. <laughs> 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 no, my staff was looking at me like she posts up. I, 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 she does post up. You know, I, I think what we have to take a look at is everybody's journey is is different. And, um, and depending upon the work that you're in, it's, it's, it's how do you take that criticism, how do you, how can you still be your authentic self? I'll give you an example. When I got ready to run for the school board, the school board is one of those positions where you have to be able to post up just a little bit based upon the constituency group you're talking to, based upon the, the chaos that is at that table and people that you're dealing with. So I had people when I got ready to run for school board who said, you know what, you gotta take those braids out of your hair, okay? Um, I was married at that time, I was in an interracial marriage, and so they said, you can't have your white husband on any of your posters or any of your information sheets because we have to deal with the racism and everything that just comes out of there. I said, first of all, I'm not straightening my hair, okay? Um, I am maintaining my braids, um, and there's gonna be certain things about my personality and my messaging that I still feel I have to be my authentic self in the community that I'm going to be serving and who people that are going to be able to listen and hear my message, I still have to present myself and be authentic in that. So I think what we have to take away from this is based upon, I agree exactly with what Yvette said, because there are certain circumstances and certain environments where even at 60 years old, I know that I cannot be my authentic self, and I realize that. Um, but you do have to be willing to listen to that feedback. You do need to understand the environment you're in, um, your audience, um, and this is going back, and I said it earlier about the code switching, it's still, important that we have to be able to do that depending upon the environment that you're in so that you can be successful. But listening and hearing and that mentorship, and I'm gonna go back to that and underscore it, it is so important. Um, but always remember that there can be two or three voices of that mentoring to help you. It just hasn't, doesn't have to be one way because all of our journeys are different. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits of AALA because that helps to point out your different might your journey might be different from somebody else's. Your personality might be different with how you deal with things, but um, it's important that you recognize and know who you are so that you can be successful. Mm -hmm. Can I just add before Tony speaks? I mean, what she said there about when she ran for office, she was willing to lose because she was going to be who she was. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm not straightening my hair. I'm not hiding my white husband. And so that's for each of us. You will come into those markers in your, your career where you have to decide, this is who I am. The same thing happened in 92 with me. Don't put your picture on your campaign literature. Mm -hmm. This community is not ready to elect a black woman. And I refused to do that. I said, I'm not playing bait and switch. They're going to know that I'm a black woman. But you have to decide where you make your stand and be willing to live with the consequences, right? Because I'm willing to lose if it means my choice is to either not be who I am or win an election, I'm willing to lose. And everybody's going to have to make that decision at some point in their career. Awesome. So first of all, I need to stop and say I'm having a moment because I remember being one of your drivers in your very first campaign, right? So I'm still trying to figure out my life, don't know who I am, but I'm driving Yvette McGee Brown and I was driving a Hyundai and she told me to park down the street because the AW workers the and all UAW, them, yeah. I had the, the UAW and I had a foreign car. 
And so she told me, drop her off and park down the street and come back. Um, and I, I kept getting hit on by those men who were like, oh, you're the prettiest driver she has. Oh. And then um, I'm sitting here with Stephanie Hightower. We had an, a group that um, one of my girlfriends spearheaded, Takesha Shepard Cheney, called Black Women's Collective. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were going around and we were still trying to figure this thing out. This was before AALA. We were trying to figure out this whole, how do we become? And, and looking at these women, we admired it. So the Black Women's Collective started, and there were 10 of us young women, and we would ask to meet with these ladies. And Stephanie had us to her house, and Donna was there, and we just, like, unpacked so much stuff. It was amazing. And then Stephanie, I will say, gave me my first leadership opportunity in an organization to be in charge of a budget and people and programs at the Columbus Urban League. And so I'm having a moment, because I'm sitting up here with them. That leads me, thank you. So that leads me to what I think we all have struggled with, which is the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about what's going on in our head and how do we unpack that, I think the Academy is huge for that because everybody suffers with it. Black, white, red, yellow. And so the, the question is, how do you respond to the imposter syndrome? And how do you respond to the voices that are in your head? Every day you wake up and you figure out, am I, am I her? Am I really who all these people, you know, these awards and accolades and your name is all over the place. Am I really her? Or today, are they going to find out there's a kink, clink in my armor? And you got to go into work and still be her. You know what I mean? And so, and then there, if you're in a leadership role, there are people looking at you and taking the temperature of what's going on in the organization based on how you show up and how you present and what you say. And so that's a lot to manage. And so I think AALA, um, and what's amazing about them is what they offer to alums, because we, it, it, the journey doesn't stop after nine months. And so I remember getting the call when we started doing efficacy training. And that was an element that was added after those of us that were early in the academy. And we got invited back in so we could tighten those muscles and build those skills. And so it's a continual journey. And I think the AALA just kind of kicks it off and starts it and catapults it. And then it's up to us to keep seeking and staying connected because we, got, we have to deal with that on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a note, uh, just a moment, we'll move the audience Q&A, so if you want to start moving to the microphone uh, to my left, uh, feel free to go ahead and do that. I'll ask uh, one other question, and you can, we'll take audience questions in just a minute. I want to uh, turn the conversation to this idea of prosperity, which is a huge conversation in our community right now. Uh, as you know, the county has led work. I know, Stephanie, you have been involved with that. Uh, the One Columbus, formerly Columbus 2020, has included as part of their tagline. When it comes to prosperity for the African-American community, uh, is it prosperity for all? Um, and how do we, what should be our role in driving that conversation locally to make sure that folks who look like us are a part of that equation? This is you. I will say, <laughs> I, you know, th this, this one is, um, it's, 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 it's complicated for me. Um, I, I will say, based upon where the, um, I'm trying to be, diplomatic here um, for a change. Um, the intentions are good. Let me just say that. The intentions are good. Uh, I think there's still a lot of work to do, Mo, uh, as it relates to really making sure that the total community is actually included in this whole idea of prosperity for all. When you look at, in the African-American community, um, the infant mortality rate that still exists, uh, when you look at the number of evictions going on in this community, and we have one of the highest rates in the, um, in the country, when you look at the number of African-American women who are homeless with children, um, we are three times the rate of the national average. When you look at the, what redlining has done in the African-American community and you look at our neighborhoods um, that still uh, do not have um, businesses there, um, you don't, you have food deserts that are everywhere, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So 
you know, and you, and you also look at from economic mobility, you look at economic disparities. I mean, those of us probably in this room, we're doing okay, but you have a bunch of folks in our community, guys, who are not doing okay. The unemployment rate in the African American community, it's at least 15 to 17 percent. And, you know, you have folks around here who are talking about we only have 4.4 percent um, unemployment rate in Columbus and Franklin County. So the disparities are there, they are real. Um, however, the intentions are good. The real question is going to be whether or not this community is um, going to put its money where its mouth is and not just depend on government entities to fund everything, but to also look at the corporate communities and look at if you really want to bring in um, uh, new businesses and then look at not just livable wage jobs, but look at career opportunities for people. Nobody, you know, um, you know, people are talking about the minimum wage. The minimum wage don't do nothing. I don't know if any of y'all can live off a minimum wage in here with your bills, but it ain't going to do nothing for anybody else. And so how do we begin to really talk about this and where is the total community going to put its money where its mouth is and really start to underwrite the cost that it's going to take in order to create the lack or to get rid of these disparities mode that actually do exist. So, I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir in here and I can go on and on, but all I can say is the intentions are good. I'm just glad that I have an opportunity to be at the table to remind people that intentions will not have to be turned into real actionable uh, deliverables. Yeah. Those are questions, feel free. Thank you, yes, absolutely. Those are questions can move to the mic. Uh, any other comments on, on that one? Well, I, I think for, for each of us sitting up here, I mean, education has been the game changer, right? And so, you know, we've got a new school superintendent. I mean, what I worry most about is that Columbus City Schools was good for me. I mean, I had teachers there who cared about me, who pushed me, who made me take the tough classes, who made sure I got to college. And what I'd like to see as we look at this strategy is, one, how do we make sure that kids are getting that same level of intensity to get them, those kids that want to go to college, to college? And then for those kids that don't want to go to college, I mean, look, we are facing a trade deficit. Um, <laughs> I can't even, I'm remodeling my house right now. The lack of skilled trade people is, it's critical. And in another 20 years, it's going to be non-existent. You need bricklayers and plumbers and, you know, HVAC people. Those are six-figure jobs. All, we need to educate our young people that not everybody's going to go to college, but let's get them into some trade schools. Let's give them the skills to have a middle-class life. And that discussion needs to be happening not only way up here, but really on the ground ground because there's so many of our young people that just don't see a future for themselves and other communities have done it. Brooklyn has a program where they are teaching girls to be plumbers. I saw it on CBS News. It was amazing. These girls were talking about they didn't want to be plumbers and now they're wearing tool belts and going in with their plungers and repairing lines. And those are the kinds of opportunities we can bring to people. People, you can't blame kids for not knowing what they're not taught. Yeah, we yeah. can do this. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and real quickly before we go into, I think it's also important to build on what Yvette said. You all have a responsibility, and a lot of you have opportunities where in your companies you are contracting out, um, and especially, you know, and when those contracts, you have a responsibility to try to, to find black-owned businesses and minority and women-owned businesses um, because that's how we begin to grow our community um, so that they can then hire those people within the communities to then continue to as we talk about this prosperity thing so you know if you you know got a catering contract or if you have a contract for supplies I think again when consulting. I'm saying I'm sorry consulting, consulting. <laughs> no I'm, ser I'm serious mm -hmm. you know um, I think we again that's why I said we have a responsibility in this room um, that when you have th those budgets and the ability to do that um, I think that those are something that that diversity piece you need to take a look at and if your company's not doing it Then how do you then? Encourage them by being able to bring those people to the table because if I hear one more time I can't find no black owned business to do something um, In this community. I'm going to scream Because there are minority and female owned businesses that can and all you can do is come over here And you can ask Kim Gales who runs my minority business assistance center and she can tell you who those people are and can deliver those services yeah. I think the only thing that I would add is that 
technology is the great divide. And I would be crazy sitting up here running the tech training program if I didn't share with you that if people do not have any digital skills whatsoever within the next five to 10 years, they won't even be able to work in fast food. Mm -hmm. And so we also need to look at our educational system about how far we are behind. I, I went to a suburban district um, presentation about what they're teaching their kids and there were fifth graders using virtual reality doing brain surgery fifth graders with the virtual reality goggles on doing brain surgery. That's in a suburban school district though. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, my kids and my beloved Columbus City Schools where I graduated from got to worry about they can't go to school because the air conditioner, they don't have any air conditioning and they can't study because it's too hot. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to figure out how to make sure that not only are we making sure that they're informed and educated, but is it the right education? The trades, I worked at AEP when they started talking, this was over 10 years ago, when they were talking about the aging workforce and they weren't going to have any linemen. Mm -hmm. Journeyman linemen make over six figures. But it's a lifestyle job. You got to work winter, spring, summer, fall, outside, and all that. But toughen people up. Share with them what the opportunity is. Offer them the training and opportunities so that they can then get these skills and apply for these roles. And then when they apply, let's make sure we're fair and inclusive in our work environment so that they stay. So there's this whole piece, and like you said, are people going to put their money where their mouth is? Because these challenges took decades to create, and we're not going to solve them with one grant that lasts 12 months that require you to get Tall. these amazing outcomes Tall. and transform people's lives <laughs> in nine months because you got to ask for the grant again Tall. before it runs out and fill out a no. Oh, you know I know that story. I still got PTSD. So I'm just saying, you <laughs> put good. your money where your mouth is. Thanks, Tony. Uh, we're going to uh, prepare to move to audience Q&A. Uh, as you know, CMC is tradition to take audience question and answer. We make, need to make sure they are questions. That means it ends with a question mark. Uh, and we uh, appreciate you not having editorial comments. Karen McGuire, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to, to compliment and extend gratitude for uh, this terrific panel. Um, I will include the moderator too. Uh, <laughs> and topic. Um, what I'm curious about is um, Luck and apparently Larry James uh, collided uh, back, what, 15 years ago when you all started to create this. Are there other cities, communities, uh, agencies, anywhere else in this country that's doing what we're doing here in Columbus with this? Uh, Carol, not many, and we often talk about at our advisory board meetings, you know, what is the secret sauce that Columbus has that makes it um, replicable in other places? I can tell you the good news is that we have uh, actually former fellows who really just as of yesterday reached out uh, in Oklahoma, uh, of all places, to, to think about this model and bring it to that community. So we are working, and I think the role that AALA is going to play is making sure the model is strong, how do we actually partner with other cities, make sure they have the philanthropic support, make sure they have the willing uh, cadre of leaders in that community that are really going to go to deep, do the deep dive and work. And so uh, we're inspiring a lot of folks to think about it. I don't think we're there yet, but I think the model has a lot of traction uh, and we're going to see some growth uh, in the next few years. So I appreciate the question, Carol. Thanks. Uh, just name and uh, organization and uh, state your question. Hi, my name is Kimberly Mason. I'm running for Columbus City School Board of Education. Um, my question is, um, in reality, sometimes when I'm coming to the tables in my day-to-day -day work, ageism is present. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know, how have you um, dealt with that in the sense of either A, somebody feeling like you're trying to age them out of their current role, or B, that you're not knowledgeable enough in the current role of what you're doing? So I, I had, I mean, I, I was elected a judge when I was 32, and so I had a lot of that. I think my response has always been to outwork and be better prepared. I think that, um, you know, when you are young going into rooms, one is I think you go in understanding that you're young, but two is to make sure that you're prepared and that you communicate in a way that does not um, give away your youth, right? That you are able to um, carry on the conversation with the people in the room, being on the back end now. <laughs> I have a lot of young associates who think it's time for me to move aside. Um, but but I, I think that it, whichever end of the spectrum you're on, it really is about your performance. And I think it's how you show up in the room, how prepared you are. And what I always say to our young associates is, 
try to anticipate every possible question that could come up before you walk into the meeting so that you're not caught off guard. And in the rare occasion you are caught off guard, don't try to BS your way through it because you'll be wrong. Just say, I, I don't know, let me get back to you. That kind of honest um, answer wins you points with people. And, 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 and I would agree. Um, I would say, you know, I'm always at this point in stage, um, you know, I don't want to be out until 9 and 10 o'clock at night. Um, I would love to be able to have somebody else join me to do that. Uh, but let me underscore, and I think it's really important what um, Yvette just talked about, being prepared. Um, that is so important. And, and I find sometimes um, with uh, young people, um, there is this entitlement attitude um, with a lot of our young folks. Um, I went to grad school, I know, I'm, I'm living with one right now. Uh, <laughs> it, it, no more than me, um, but anyway. Um, but, so, but I think there's, that, there's this entitlement piece that because I have this education that I know, that's why I think it's important, the mentoring, the, the listening to feedback from people is important. And you know what, it, it's okay to go in the room and not say anything. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. It's okay to go in the room and not say anything. Yes. But to be able to listen, um, I think is so important. And I think that's some of the things that are missing um, with a lot of our young professionals when they come in the room. Um, they think they know it all. And um, I respect the fact that there are people in this room that know more than I know um, because of their experience. And I think we need to have more young people who respect that. Um, and that when they come into the rooms, they understand who's in those rooms and they're prepared. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, sir. My name is Ron L. Tomlinson. I'm with the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. More than 22 years ago now, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled that the way they were funding public school education was unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that on the, the federal government with the Brown versus Board, it took more than two decades later before integration was dismantled, I mean, before desegregation was dismantled. Mm -hmm. So what does Ohio needs to do to now do what the Supreme Court said, which is fund it differently? If only we had a Supreme Court justice in the room. Vote. Oh. Vote. So this is the problem. It is the most frustrating case we've ever had. And, and I used to talk to Chief Justice Moyer about this. He'd say, what are we going to do, put the entire General Assembly in jail? Because the, the only way the court enforces its orders is through contempt powers. And so when the General Assembly ignores the court's order, the court's a recourse is to find somebody in contempt, which they're not going to do, particularly when you're in an all one party system. So I think that what people have to do is vote. I mean, don't just listen to what people tell you during election year. Watch what they do. And the resources that are allocated, the way that we continue to rely on property taxes is not a fair way of funding schools. And we need to look at saying that when we say that children are entitled to an education, what does that mean in terms of investment? We continue to cut tax dollars for people that don't need tax dollars cut, and we continue to not invest in schools that need them most. Now, I will give Governor DeWine credit. He has done a disproportionate investment in urban schools, and he made some of the suburban schools angry when he did that. I think we've got to have some bold leadership that says the kids going to school in poorer communities come with a host of communities. I remember David Baker saying this to me once where I, he was talking about um, the inner city schools, and he said, if I took your kids and put your kids at Pilgr Pilgrim Elementary, they'd do fine because they're coming home to you. And you're going to make sure they get their homework done, they get a good night's sleep. You know, they're getting food to eat. And so what we've got to be honest about is it's not just the location of the school. It's all of the other things that contribute to these students not being able to come in prepared to learn. That's good. That's good. Yes, sir. Uh, Cornell Bradbury uh, Company, uh, Operation Warm. Also, I'm an AALA uh, nominee as well. Um, first of all, there's a uh, wealth of knowledge up there and just we appreciate you guys for just taking the time to come out um, My question is really um, I guess basic so I'm I, I work for, like I said operation warm I'm the first african-american executive that they hired um, And right now I was wondering what kind of advice would you have on? creating you know methods or groups that can encourage um, supplying jobs for african-americans hmm. So um, 
I guess I would say initially looking at what the what the track record or the record has been, kind of what has the organization been doing, and how has that been working for you? And uh, if you um, determine that it hasn't been where it should be or what it needs to be, or there's just opportunity, then really being strategic about how you introduce something, maybe getting a team of advisors together to, to talk it through, to say, here are our opportunities, here are our assets, and then how can we bring something to bear that is strategic, that um, people could really buy into, because you're going to have to push it. If, if folks haven't heard this before, like, you guys, we need to really really focus on X, Y, and Z, then that's change, right? So you got to do some change management. And so I think getting like a team of folks um, that either have gone through this process in their own organizations or even maybe in the midst of it, because that brain trust coming together to help build some strategy that you can take back to your own organizations is better than you sitting somewhere trying to think of it yourself. Gotcha. And so just lean on the folks that you have available to you to support building a strategy. Gotcha. Thank you. So I'll, um, I'll ask Emma one question to give it back to Ray. So just uh, we're talking about 15 years. What does this 15-year milestone mean for uh, this community? Uh, 15 years of African American Leadership Academy, uh, still doing well, so much more work to do. But what does it mean to you personally? And then what's the work ahead need to look like for the academy? I'll start with Tony. So personally, for me, it means that there are 205 individuals out here in this community that if any organizations, corporations, or others are looking for folks to step up, to join your boards, to join your corporate boards, to um, take over initiatives, major initiatives, lead the charge in trying to figure out some of these systemic challenges that we have. The AALA has 205 graduates who stand ready to uh, support and to step into those roles. Going forward, um, I love the model that we have where fellows get to nominate the next group that comes in because we talk to our peers and those that come to us for mentorship and we know, oh, let's put you forth and your opportunity should be to go through this academy and have this amazing experience so that you can figure out who you are and then what your strengths are and where you want to plug into this community. So I think it's important we keep this going because we, we can keep the pipeline flowing full of individuals who are prepared to take the next step. Any other comments on that? And we'll get one other Q&A okay. from the audience. Um, what it gives me enormous pride, because uh, following up on what Tony said, we see our fellows in every company in this community. And I have watched them. I feel like they're proud mom, right? I've watched them just catapult to the next level of leadership. And it is really, it, I just think this community, Columbus has something special. I think AALA is adding to that specialness. And what I'm excited to see is when we get that first African-American leadership fellow into the, the CEO spot, because I think it will happen. I think it will happen. I think we have positioned people to really lead this community in a variety of different ways, from government to nonprofit and from the corporate sector. Very good, very good. Take one last audience question. Thank you so much for carving out time for my question. My name is Shakira Decree. I am one of the faculty members at Columbus Academy, and we brought some of our African American ninth graders with us. Oh, awesome. And yes, and we are just so proud that they are with us today, first of all. Yes and that they wanted to be a part of this. So I am really um, just thankful for this conversation and that the, um, that the students have an opportunity to be a part of this discourse. I think that's very exciting. I would ask you to, and I'm a therapist, so excuse me for this therapy type question, to consider speaking to your younger self and looking at these students who are here and just how they are trying to maneuver their way. First of all, it's a predominantly white um, institution. Um, so as far as them becoming leaders and they're the next generation coming up, how can they maneuver that and really be their authentic selves as far as, you know, navigating through being at schools like Columbus Academy as well? I think that's important. Thank you. Very good. So I'll, I'll um, 
just so you know, both of our children graduated from uh, Columbus Academy. Um, and uh, it, it was an amazing experience uh, for, um, for, for Cameron, um, and it has catapulted him. Young people, please um, understand that this is a gift that you have Amen. to be able to go to a private school of that caliber. Um, but at the same time, uh, we still know that, as you just pointed out, it is still a majority. Um, and um, a fluent school, and so our children do have challenges when they are there. I would suggest um, that you continue to figure out how to be your authentic self um, so, and, be, and be proud of it and be okay with it. And because you have parents, um, I'm going to assume that are actively engaged in your education, like a lot of some of our young people don't have parents engaged, that you need to lean on your parents. Mm -hmm. I know that's hard being young people sometimes when mm -hmm. lean on your parents. Mm -hmm. um, when you do have challenges, when you do have someone that says something inappropriate to you, um, when you do have a teacher who is not being fair and equitable in how she is asking or for whatever expectations of you as opposed to your classmates. I think you have to lean on your parents. And I really appreciate the fact now that they do have, I think, um, an advisory parent group there that was just starting this, uh, when my son um, was finishing up. Um, but be your, I would just say be your authentic self. And whatever that looks like um, and whatever it is, be okay with it and be proud of it. Um, and know that you will be able to use this education to go on and do great things in the future. And as my son was a 2015 grad, he was student body president his uh, senior year. And what I'm going to say to you is what I said to him. You ain't there for a social contest, you get your books. <laughs> get your books. And let me be very clear with you. I get it is not it is not nirvana. There are no environment that you walk into is nirvana. But understand this. You, as Stephanie said, it is a great privilege to go to a school like that. I would get everything, as my grandmother used to say, take everything those teachers have to teach you, because once they give it to you, they can never take it back. Right. And what they are giving you is the gift of education. So when the dumb stuff happens, you tune that out and you focus on your books mm -hmm. and you focus on the reason that you're there because you're going to go to a great college. My son graduated from college in May. He is working for McKinsey making a six-figure salary at 22 years old. Wow. That's the gift you That's get from gift. Columbus Academy. All right. So have confidence in who you are. Mm -hmm. Know that you deserve to be there and you are smart enough to compete mm -hmm. and get your books. Very good. Right. Um, <laughs> I would just add that whatever Yvette says, you should listen to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have our sponsors to thank again, uh, Crab Brown James. And just for a second, in case for maybe the two or three people in the room who don't know, this is Larry James right here. <laughs> Donna's not here, so we, we would have just honored her as even more so. Yeah. Um, and Deloitte, our other sponsor, want to knock out? And our speakers again, Yvette McGee Brown, Stephanie uh, Hightower, Tony Cunningham, and Mo Wright. And thank you for, for being here today and engaging in this conversation. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.